In this video, I will dissect parts of the 1914 teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses. I would recommend you to follow me with the literature at hand. You will need What Does the Bible Really Teach? and I will provide the link to the Watchtower Online Library in the description and the Daniel book, which is unfortunately not available online. So you either need a hard copy or the Watchtower Library CD. 1914 is one of the very core teachings where many beliefs are based upon. So, let us find out how that teaching stands its ground in our inspection. This will be a bit lengthy and I apologize for it, as there is just too much that can be said about it and I'll try to, to limit myself to, to the most important parts. I won't cover 1914 in its entirety because this would be far too long and I will cut this into parts. I'm not yet sure how many, let's just see how it goes. To begin with, before even starting with the explanation that they provide, there is one obvious question in my head. And that is, why do Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Acts 1 verse 7 does not apply to them? Please turn to Acts 1 verse 7 and read. He said to them, It does not belong to you to know the times or seasons that the Father has placed in his own jurisdiction. In the inside book, we can find the following statement under the topic seasons. The times or seasons or periods when Jehovah's will in certain matters would take place were of real inter interest to his worshippers. It's then uh, quoting uh, Acts 1 verse 7. Who understood them as they were progressively revealed, according to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So things would be revealed progressively. And they try to make this seem biblical by citing 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. And it says there, Now, as for the times and the seasons, brothers, you need nothing to be written to you. Okay, nothing need to be written to us. So they obviously knew what it meant. But what about progressive revelations? Why don't we read a little further to get some context? And I guess the word context will sooner or later be refined in the pure language of Jehovah's Witnesses. Because context is their enemy. Anyways, let's read till verse 6. For you yourselves know very well that Jehovah's Day is coming exactly as a thief in the night. Whenever it is that they are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction is to be instantly on them, just like birth pains on a pregnant woman. And they will, be by, no, they will by no means escape. But you, brothers, you are not in darkness, so that the day should overtake you as it would Thieves, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We belong neither to night nor to darkness. So then, let us not sleep on as the rest do, but let us stay awake and keep our senses. Okay, so Jehovah's Day will come like a thief in the night. But is there any indication on the disciples knowing in adva advance when this would be? Why should they keep their senses? Why should they not sleep? Why should they stay awake? Would a thief announce his coming? Even in a cryptic way? Would it follow any logic to assume that anyone would know when, quote-unquote, the thief would come? Interestingly enough, the same parable is used in J.W.'s favorite chapter, Matthew 24, verse 43 and 44. Let's read it. But know one thing, if the householder had known in what watch the thief was coming, he would have kept awake and not allowed his house to be broken into. On this account, you too prove yourselves ready 
because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not think to be it. Doesn't this verse make it pretty damn clear that the point is to stay awake? Not knowing in advance by progressive revelations? I mean, if you, if you know when everything's going to happen, why should you stay awake? Why should you stay on the watch? But okay, let's put all this aside and just assume, okay? Assume that someone would have been given the task to calculate the hour of Christ's presence. How do the JWs do it? Let's go and read the appendix of what does the Bible really teach? But be warned, you might feel symptoms of an appendicitis by reading the appendix. Please, bring your seats into an, an upright position, fasten your seat belts. This is going to be a bumpy ride. Let's start with the appendix. Decades in advance, Bible students proclaimed that there would be significant developments in 1914. What were these? And what evidence points to 1914 as such an important year? Oh, awesome! They knew it decades in advance and they're going to provide evidence. Wow! Let's see how they knew all that. Let's read on. As recorded, at Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the nations until the appointed times of the nations, or the times of the Gentiles, according to the King James Version, are fulfilled. Jerusalem had been the capital city of the Jewish nation, the seat of rulership, of the line of kings from the house of King David. However, these kings were unique among national leaders. They sat on Jehovah's throne as representatives of God himself. Jerusalem was thus a symbol of Jehovah's rulership. Okay, we're just one paragraph into this and I'm a bit puzzled. Jesus probably spoke to his disciples around the year 30 AD or CE, but, but don't name it down on the exact date. A couple of years earlier or later doesn't make any difference. So Jesus, let's assume, Jesus spoke in 30 AD. He spoke about Jerusalem, a city, being trampled on by the nations. Is, is there any, and I mean any, a single hint towards the house of King David? Oh, but Jerusalem was the capital of the Jews, the seat of rulership for the Davidian kings. Doesn't that clarify the matter? Well, let me use my own parable here. I'll make a prophecy and this is just kidding, okay? Next year, Paris will be trampled on by the nations. When you hear that prophecy... Wouldn't you immediately think of the line of kings that once reigned in Paris? Of course! I mean, especially all those people living in Paris would immediately think of Charles IV, called the Mad, because he reigned in Paris 600 years ago. You get my point? No one would ever think of someone who reigned 600 years ago if you said something about the city he reigned in. Sorry, but that's just weird. But it gets better. Which Davidian king got killed in the first fulfillment of this prophecy? Oh, the Davidian reg regency ended 600 years ago. So actually, it was not about the Davidian line of kings in the first fulfillment. We could stop here and laugh about the attempt to jump over Acts 1 verse 7. But no, not with the JWs. If they see a sand trap, they take a run. I won't go into the question of Jerusalem being a symbol of Jehovah's rulership, as this would distract us. But do it on your own if you want to. Let's continue reading. How and when, though, did God's rulership begin to be trampled on by the nations? Oh, no, it's God's rulership. This happened in 607 BCE, when Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. Jehovah's throne became vacant. And the line of kings who descended from David was interrupted. Would this trampling go on forever? 
No, for the prophecy of Ezekiel said regarding Jerusalem's last king, Zedekiah, remove the turban and take off the crown. It will not belong to anyone until the one who has the legal right comes and I will give it to him. The one who has the legal right to the Davidic crown is, Jesus, is Christ Jesus. So the trampling would end when Jesus became king. Oh, okay. So the second fulfillment of the prophecy was actually history already when spoken out? Interesting. The, the, the beginning of the second fulfillment began earlier than the actual first fulfillment, which occurred in 70 AD and not in 6 or 7 BC. And I don't want to go into 6 or 7 right now. Maybe we address that in, a, in a, another video. Let's read another paragraph. When would that great event occur? Jesus showed that the Gentiles would rule for a fixed period of time. The account in Daniel chapter 4 holds the key to knowing how long that period would last. It relates a prophetic dream experienced by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He saw a tree of enormous height that was chopped down. Its stump could not grow because it was banded with iron and copper. An angel declared, let seven times pass over it. I could imagine the following conversation after this paragraph has been read in a, in a book study. Oh, interesting. So there is a link between Luke 21 verse 24 and Daniel chapter 4? Er, uh, no. I mean, there is no reference to Daniel 4 made by Jesus? Er, uh, nope. But, but they were obviously talking about the same thing, things, right? Well, Daniel chapter 4 does neither talk about Jerusalem or times of the nations or the Davidian kings. Well, well but, but then what biblical basis do we have to draw a connection between Daniel 4 and Luke 21 verse 24? Oh, none. But we have the faithful and discreet slave telling us so he, who cares about that old book? Probably it's old light anyways. Okay, now serious. I could not find any connection between Luke 21, 24 and Daniel chapter 4. To me, this is pure wishful thinking. But let's assume we would find one. What about Daniel chapter 4? Let's read a little further. In the Bible, trees are sometimes used to represent rulership. So the chopping down of the symbolic tree represents how God's rulership, as expressed through the kings at Jerusalem, would be interrupted. However, the vision served notice that this trampling of Jerusalem would be temporary, a period of seven times. How long a period is that? Oh, trees represent rulership. Interesting. Did you gain any insight on what all this had to do with what Jesus said about Jerusalem being trampled by the nations? Did the provided evidence suffice you to believe that the tree is about Jehovah's rulership? No? Okay, so let's dig a little deeper. Let's see what the Daniel book tells us about this. Unfortunately, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the video, it's not available online. So you have to use your, your CD-ROM or hard copy if you have one. If you're not familiar with Daniel chapter 4, I would kindly ask you to pause the video here and read the entire chapter. Because this will help you later, once we go into the, the Daniel book, uh, to understand the points I'm trying to make. Okay? So... If, if it has been a while since you read Daniel chapter 4, just pause the video, take the five minutes to read the chapter, and then uh, play the video, okay? I will now read paragraph 10 on page 87 of the Daniel book. Upon hearing the dream, Daniel was momentarily astonished, then fearful. Urged by Nebuchadnezzar to explain it, the prophet said, Oh, my lord! May the dream apply to those hating you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you beheld, that grew great and became strong. 
It is you, O king, because you have grown great and become strong, and your grandeur has grown great and reached to the heavens and your rulership to the extremity of the earth. In the scriptures, trees can symbolize individuals, rulers, and kingdoms. Like the immense tree of his dream, Nebuchadnezzar has grown great and become strong as the head of a world power. But rulership to the extremity of the earth, involving the whole kingdom of mankind, is represented by the great tree. It therefore symbolizes Jehovah's universal sovereignty, particularly in his relationship to the earth. Okay, so now we are clear that in the first fulfillment of this prophecy, the tree stood for Nebuchadnezzar. All this is supposed to teach him that Jehovah gives the kingdom of mankind to whomever he pleases, according to verse 17. If you read the whole chapter, and hope you did, it gets clear that Jehovah is above the tree because he can send a watcher commanding to chop down even the most powerful kingdom on earth. But what this paragraph now attempts is just ridiculous. It states, But rulership to the extremity of the earth involving the whole kingdom of mankind is represented by the great tree. It therefore symbolizes Jehovah's universal sovereignty, particularly in its relationship to the earth. Well, we, we just read it right from the Bible in verse 20 to 22. The tree that you saw, it is you, O king. That's what it specifically said, referring to Nebuchadnezzar. But the paragraph tells us, no, no, this is not what it means. It actually means that this is Jehovah's rulership. The tree is Jehovah's rulership. If so, who then sent the watcher to chop down the tree? Jehovah chopped himself down? Let me quote Matthew 12, 24 to you on this matter. Every kingdom divided against itself comes to ruin, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Does, it make, does this make sense to you? No? Be patient, it gets worse. The following paragraphs then go through the explanation of the prophecy as given in Daniel 4 itself. If you want, read them, I won't discuss them here. But starting with paragraph 24, it gets exciting again. Seatbelt still fastened? Great. As represented by the great tree, Nebuchadnezzar symbolized world rulership. But remember, the tree stands for rulership and sovereignty far grander than that of Babylon's king. It symbolizes the universal sovereignty of Jehovah, the king of the heavens, especially with respect to the earth. Before Jerusalem's destruction by the Babylonians, the kingdom centered in that city with David and his heirs sitting on Jehovah's throne represented God's sovereignty with reference to the earth. God himself had such sovereignty chopped down and banded in 607 BC when he used Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Jerusalem. Exercise of divine sovereignty toward the earth by a kingdom in the line of David was restrained for seven times. How long were these seven times? When did they begin? And what marked their end? Okay, first of all, it was not Nebuchadnezzar that, that symbolized world rulership. He actually had world rulership. Let's be precise, okay? It was the tree in the prophecy that symbolized world rulership. Furthermore, I think after reading Matthew 12, 24 and using your gray matter between your, the ears, it is obvious that the tree does not also represent Jehovah's universal sovereignty. And please, how dare you even think that David sitting on Jehovah's throne might symbolize Jehovah's universal sovereignty. Yes, he was sitting on Jehovah's throne, but symbolizing his universal sovereignty? I mean, this line of kings was never even close to world power. Not even close. Oftentimes, there were vassals, subjected to gentle, gentle kings, too weak to defend themselves. 
exercising divine sovereignty by kingdom in the line of David, being restrained for seven times? Sorry, but this is just nonsense to me. Let's read Psalms 145 verse 13. Your kingship is an eternal kingship, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Does that sound to you like giving up sovereignty over earth for some time? Let us see how this continues. During Nebuchadnezzar's madness, his very hair grew long just like eagles, feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. This took longer than seven days or seven weeks. Various translations read, seven times and alternatives are appointed definite times or time periods. A variant of the old Greek reads seven years. The seven times were treated as seven years by the first century Jewish historian Just, uh, Josephus. And certain Hebrew scholars have viewed these times as years. Seven years is the rendering in the in an American translation, today's English version, and the translation by James Moffat. Oh, wow! This was kind of a leap over huge parts of this prophecy. They dig right into the seven times. But I would have some questions about the second fulfillment. But as they will raise f more questions during the next paragraphs, let us just collect the questions and I will... I will tell you my questions uh, at the end of the, uh, the uh, this chapter. So let's read on. Evidently, Nebuchadnezzar's seven times involve seven years. In prophecy, a year averages 360 days, or 12 months of 30 days each. So the king's seven times, or seven years, were 360 days multiplied by seven, or 2520 days. But what about the major fulfillment of his dream? The prophetic seven times lasted much longer than 2,520 days. This was indicated by Jesus' words, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the nations until the appointed times of the nations are fulfilled. The trampling began in 607 BCE, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the typical kingdom of God ceased to function in Judah. When would the trampling end? At the times of restorations of all things, when divine sovereignty would again be manifested toward the earth through symbolic Jerusalem, the kingdom of God. In this paragraph, all they do is to claim the following. Quote unquote, evidently, seven times are seven years. Sorry, but where has that been proven? I mean, they translate it, but... Uh, it is speculation. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that these seven times are actually seven years. Then, without explaining how the times can refer to a prophetic year, they just assume that this is the case. And to me, Revelation 12 is far from a general definition of a prophetic year. It is a different prophecy, and to me it is not clear how the times in plural mentioned in Revelation must definitely mean specifically two to add up to three and a half. But that aside, where in Jesus' words did they find an indication that the trampling would last for any specific length of time? I can't find an indication of a specific time span that would be indicated in the Bible. I mean, he's talking about appointed times of nations are fulfilled. But did he say, okay, this will be told to you somewhere? And why do seven times refer to prophetic years instead of regular ones? Where does the Bible tell us to split up times into 360 days and then convert days into years again? Sorry, I don't get it. Maybe the next paragraph will enlighten us a bit. If we were to count 2,520 literal days from Jerusalem's destruction in 607 BC, that would bring us only to 600 BC, a year having no scriptural significance. 
even in 537 BC, when the liberated Jews were back in Judah, Jehovah's sovereignty was not manifested on the earth. That was so because Zerubbabel, the heir to David's throne, was made not king but only governor to the Persian province of Judah. Oh, now everything falls into place. I see. Nothing happened after 2520 days. So therefore they had to apply. Second Splain 1337, where it says, Those shall take days for years if nothing happened. Okay, my sarcasm again. I'm sorry. But seriously, all they provide you is the nothing happened argument? That's all they have? <laughs> Ridiculous, sorry. Let's read on. Since the seven times are prophetic, we must apply to the 2520 days the scriptural rule a day for a year. This rule is set out in a prophecy regarding the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. The seven times of earth's domination by Gentile powers without interference by God's kingdom therefore spent 2520 years. They began with the desolation of Judah and Jerusalem in the seventh lunar month, Tishri, 15 of 607 BC. From that point to 1 BC is 606 years. The remaining 1914 years stretch from then to 1914 CE. Thus, the seven times or 2520 years ended by Tishri 15 or October 4th 5th 1914 CE. Hmm. Now, p please help me again. Where did the Bible say to, to, to jump from seven times to 2,520 days again? And where did it say to apply something that happened in Ezekiel 4? Was Ezekiel establishing a kind of general rule? Or Numbers 14, maybe? Maybe there was a hint that Nebuchadnezzar's madness lasted 2,520 days? No? Sorry, this, this is all just speculation. And it doesn't add up. But let's go on. In that year, the appointed times of the nations were fulfilled, and God gave rulership to the lowliest one of mankind, Jesus Christ, who had been considered so base by his foes that they even had him impaled. To enthrone the messianic king, Jehovah loosened the symbolic iron and copper bands around the root stock of his own sovereignty. The Most High God thus allowed a royal sprout to grow from it as a manifestation of divine sovereignty towards the earth by means of the heavenly kingdom in the hands of David's greatest heir, Jesus Christ. How we thank Jehovah for this blessed turn of events and for unraveling the mystery of the great tree. I think for, for all believers in the Bible, this must be a slap in the face right now. Please, how can you call Jesus Christ the Son of God, the lowliest one of mankind? Is there any, I mean any single verse, any biblical support for this argument? for this arrogant and presumptuous statement. How many Bible verses did they provide to back it up? Exactly zero. What, why don't you search the Bible for lowliest one of mankind and see if you can find any verse referencing to Jesus? I could talk more about this, but this would go too far. Take the Watchtower Library CD and research it for yourself if you're curious. But they also explain. The Most High God thus allowed a royal sprout to grow from its as a manifestation of divine sovereignty toward the earth by means of the heavenly kingdom in the hands of David's great heir, Jesus Christ. Oh, so the first sign of divine sovereignty toward the earth which supposedly manifested in 1914, is that Satan is cast down towards Earth. And as Watchtower makes it, its members believe, the worst times on the Earth ever began? This is a sign of divine sovereignty toward the Earth? 
Sorry, but, but that's just ridiculous. I mean, if World War One is supposed to be a sign of divine sovereignty toward the Earth, I, I, I just don't get it. And it is in conflict with the verses they provide to make the point of the sprout rising. I mean, read Isaiah 11. It is the chapter where the wicked ones are put to death and the nursing child will play over the lair of a cobrock. Please check the other verses out in context on your own. The video is long enough. So, wasn't that a sound explanation of the second fulfillment? Well, I promised some more questions. Let us compare the symbols of the first and second fulfillment. The tree in the first fulfillment was Nebuchadnezzar's world rulership. In the second fulfillment, or greater fulfillment, it is supposedly Jehovah's universal sovereignty. The tree was chopped to demonstrate that the Most High, which I think is Jehovah, is ruler in the kingdom of mankind and that he gives it to whomever he wants and he sets up over it even the lowliest of men. Well, if the tree is Jehovah's sovereignty, whom chopped it down? How did this demonstrate that he is ruler in the kingdom of mankind? And Nebuchadnezzar was given the heart of a beast. Was Jehovah's sovereignty given the heart of a beast too? Or maybe Jesus, who is said to be represented by the lowliest of men? How would humanity, according to verse 17, recognize that the Most High is ruler in the kingdom of mankind if he allowed his sovereignty to be chopped off for more than two and a half millennia? Aren't now all questions concerning Daniel chapter 4 sorted out by reading the Daniel's prophecy book? The rest of the appendix in what does the Bible really teach does not really add anything we haven't discussed already. It just mentions 6 or 7, which I may cover in another video, let's see, and Matthew 24 and Luke 21, which also would provide material for another video. Furthermore, we might ask ourselves why the 2520 years should have ended in October 1914 and World War One, which is said to be an effect of Satan cast out of heaven, started on July 28th, 1914. So even before he was said to be cast out of heaven, maybe Satan acted based on his understanding of Bible prophecy? I think that's it for today. If you like this kind of videos, please like it. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel and tell me in the comments what topic you would like to see covered. What other topics you would like to see covered. Till next time.